So welcome to lecture three, part C, and we're still in the measure phase of the DMAIC, and we're talking about quality metrics. We looked at first pass yield, we've looked at parts per million, we've looked at roll throughput yield. We didn't really talk about DPU, but DPU is the average number of defects, so it's the total number of defects found divided by the total number of units or products built. Uh, we're now going to talk about DPMO and sigma level. Now, DPMO is a very valuable metric because we're looking at part complexity. So let's say, for example, you have two products, assembly A and assembly B. Would it be fair to set the same quality goal for assembly A and assembly B? And the answer is no, but typically they would be. So you'd set maybe 95% goal or 99% here or 99% for this. In actual fact, assembly A is a much easier assembly. Even if you were working on the assembly line building it, you basically you have four screws here and a base plate. So you have five parts. Down here you have 11 screws and a base plate. So you have 12 parts. But the opportunity for error is much less up here. Basically you may not put the screw in correctly or you may not put it in at all but there's only four chances down here there's 11 screws which may not go in correctly or not in at all but you could also mix up maybe this star one would end up up here uh, this flat head here would end up down here and so on so the opportunities for defects is a key concept in Six Sigma now there's different definitions for opportunities there's the number of parts in the product such as I've described here or you could take the number of process steps or in some um, organizations this number of critical defect types for a particular process step. The main thing is that it's consistent, at least within your organization. So now we're going to look at uh, DPMO. So the DPMO calculation is the total number of defects divided by the total number of opportunities for defects, which we just talked about, multiplied by a million. The total number of opportunities for defects, the denom denominator here in this equation, is the total number of opportunities for defects is the OFD for one unit multiplied by the number of units built. Now this could be opportunities, could be lines of software code, could be parts and so on. And what we do is with the DPMO is it allows us to make a comparison between two different products of different complexity. And a lot of cases we can also benchmark data. So we'll take an example now on the pen holder. So in this case their pen holder, we'll call it pen A, has 15 opportunities for defects. We'll just take it that there are 15 there, maybe this part, this part, there's three, there's four parts there, and there's a certain number of process steps. Um, and we assembled a thousand of them and we found 30 defects. So what's the DPMO rate? Well, the DPMO is the total number of defects, which is 30, divided by the total number of opportunities for defects, which is 15 by 1,000, which is 15,000, multiplied by a million. So we get a figure of 2,000 DPMO. Now let's compare that with, say, in the same pen holder factory. Let's say we're making this pen holder. We calculate the defects per unit for pen A and pen B, and the defects per unit is 0 0.030. So basically, pen A has on average 30 defects per 1,000 pen holders, and pen B has on average 190 defects per 1,000 pen holders. The yield of pen A is 97.04%, and the yield of pen holder B is 82.7%. So when you're looking at these metrics here and you're not measuring DPMO, the question is which product is performing better, pen A or pen B? And intuitively you would think pen A is performing much better than pen holder B. But pen holder B is much more complex, so it's not fair to compare them as apples with apples. And this is where DPMO comes into its own. So in the DPMO here, we can calculate the DPU, the number of units built, the opportunities, the defects, and you can see the DPMO level is are almost identical, 2,000 versus 1,959. So they're almost identical. In fact, penholder B has a lower DPMO level, so it's actually performing better because it's taking into account the complexity of the product. There's much more parts in this. And then we can, we can convert that to what's called a product sigma level, so in this case, 4.405. So the sigma levels are almost identical. So let's take a little look at the sigma levels. So this is where the six sigma comes into play. So a six sigma process, while we defined it as a structured problem solving methodology, it's also the equivalent of 3.4 parts per million. So for every million parts you build, there's 3.4 of them um, defects. And there's a graph here where we can look at the sigma level uh, versus the number of defects. So 1.5 sigma, you're up here at about half a million. 
you know, at four sigma, four point five sigma, you're at about one thousand three hundred and fifty. So the next um, sigma benchmark data links the sigma, the yield, the DPMO, and the cost of poor quality. Remember we looked at earlier. So most companies, organizations are in this space here, three to four sigma, maybe four point five sigma. So the yields are in the ninety three to ninety nine percent range. Their DPMO levels typically around the four sigma mark would be six thousand. And their cost of poor quality, which is the percentage of their sales they're spending on, on poor quality, is 15 to 20%. Now, very few are up in the five and six sigma space. But you can see um, the impact of moving from three sigma to six sigma. You know, you aren't just twice as good. From a DPMO level, you're 20,000 times better. So what's important when you're collecting defects and you set up your system is that every defect is valuable information. Why? Because you set up a quality system, a process, and so on to prevent defects. So you can almost think of it like a, a prison camp. You know, when one escapes, you can learn a lot from it. You've got to also record typical defects, which are often considered part of the process. We just say that's the way we always say it. We correct forms and documents. We do a bit of touch up. We do a bit of minor rework. So all these defects, when you start measuring them, you can then investigate how the defect occurred. Because every time there's a defect, it does affect all these other metrics. So some of the lean metrics such as capacity, financial metrics such as cost. If you're touching up and reworking product, you know, it's been shown that that product isn't reliable as maybe a product that came out right first time. If you're not sure of what your defect levels are, you can't be predictable. So you can't tell your customer what they're going to get, when they're going to get it. So the customer is going to be unhappy. So that's the end of the uh, measure phase. And the task we've identified in the measure phase, we've identified our metrics, our whys. We've collected uh, variable data as opposed to attribute data, so actual real measurements, the diameter of the um, pen holder, slots or holes, uh, as opposed to attribute data, which is either they're good or they're bad. So if you can collect variable data, numbers, then that's much better. We've generated some descriptive statistics. We've evalu evaluated our current measurement systems. We've investigated and removed special cause variation. And we've selected the improvement approach for each metric.